Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of The Next. I'm your host, Mike Walker, and today we are going to continue our panel conversation about the Gartner Emerging Technologies hype cycle. And so we've got Arun Ghosh with us today. We're going to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Unfortunately, uh, he had to leave our panel a little bit early in our previous conversation. So we're picking up with Arun to go deeper into his thoughts on the emerging technologies hype cycle for 2020, uh, but also from a management consultancy perspective, what is this unique vantage point, this unique view into the hype cycle? And so we're going to get into really interesting topics like does Gartner suffer from its own hype when it comes to the hype cycle? We're going to talk about where there's some things where they were playing it a little too safe on their technology selections, or what were some of the key misses on technologies that we thought should have been on the hype cycle. So we're going to get into all that and a whole lot more. So definitely stick around. Now, like always, all of our show notes and links will be included uh, in the comments and on www.vnextpod.com. That's vnextpod.com. All right, guys, let's get into it. All right, Arun, welcome back, my friend. Hey, Mike, happy to be back again. Yes, thank so, you. So, you know, we, we came through on our promise that uh, we weren't going to leave you out. We know that you had a prior commitment um, uh, on our group panel. But uh, now, more importantly, though, you're able to partake in Bourbon Hour, right? That is correct. And I brought the Buffalo Trace along, all uh, traces included. Nice. So tell me, um, so why Buffalo Trace? Why, why is that your bourbon pick for this evening? So it's very rare, I think, to find a good blend, right? So it's either rye or Kentucky straight bourbon, distilled, bought or not. And, you know, early on, I, I mentioned that, you know, it's a, a bourbon, a good bourbon is when you drink in good times, bad times, not so good times, and always anytime you want, right? Just the way you have it back there. And so uh, Buffalo Trace just um, is one of the smoothest, finest bourbons I've had that's got a good infusion of rye, barley, um, and, and a couple of other components, just make it unique. It's just very drinkable. And that's when you know you, you, you it hits the spot, goes down easy, and puts you in a nice mood for a great <laughs> conversation. Always a great conversation with Mike Walker. So, yeah. okay. <laughs> well, um, so last time I had one bourbon, but uh, I've kind of gone by back to my, my standby. So your standby is uh, the Buffalo Trace. My standby is the uh, the Woodford Reserve. That's right. Yeah. And, and so in the spirit of the Kentucky Derby that is uh, going to be virtual this year, I thought it, I would it, whip it, out it, the, the special yeah. edition uh, bourbon it's here. Very cool. The other one, so my other standby is Victor's. So on, on, on another occasion, um, their rise is spectacular. So we'll, we'll talk about that another day. <laughs> we'll, we'll most certainly have to do that. So uh, cheers, my friend. Salute. All right. So um, where we left off. So uh, in, in the conversation, uh, we were talking about kind of our broad thoughts around uh, the emerging technologies hype cycle. Um, the other panelists and myself, we had um, a deeper conversation into... Uh, really what the hype cycle means to their specific, uh, uh, essentially, perspective uh, mm -hmm. on how they use it. And so I guess, you know, to kind of kick us off here, Arun, um, when, when you see the emerging technologies hype cycle, uh, how is that typically, how do you typically use that within KPMG? Do you use it with clients? Uh, is it something that you guys use internally? How do you guys use that? So I think if, if, I, if I may... Uh, in, a, in a typical consulting fashion. <laughs> I'll go about the wrong, long way, but yes, let's it, do it. I'll keep it succinct. I think what's happened over time, so you know, if, if I can sort of step back from the hype cycle, I think 
and we were talking about this the other night, right? In terms of you know the hype cycle is overhyped sometimes, and uh, it's it's at a point where, especially with COVID, the, the the it's business the speed of innovation, right? The business you know going back to this business the speed of thought, uh, one of my favorite books of all time, with Bill Gates, right? Um, yeah. And the hype cycle doesn't matter anymore. Everything's exploded. Even today, if you look at earnings after earnings after earnings, this whole phenomenon with with TikTok and now Walmart and Microsoft coming together to to pursue TikTok in all earnest gives rise to the fact that what is TikTok, right? Why is it to your point about hype, right? Talk about hype, right? Yep. And have they made money? Are they cash flow positive? Who cares? Look at the gobs and gobs of millions of users, the captured market, and the channel that's made. It, it invented a new channel. Just when you thought there could be no more social media, now you have another platform. And so when you look at these examples from an enterprise perspective, you step back and say, huh, okay, if I have especially if you're you know in a traditional consulting world you're front middle and back office right so if you're looking at front office transformation you have to look at beyond the hype right yeah. so whether it's trusted transactions and i'm in the blockchain business right it comes back to cashless pointless uh, uh, contactless pointless I mean, usually uh, things i say come out pointless but anyway <laughs> it's 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 it's, it's that it's the is the shaping the new commercial ecosystem through a TikTok or through a WhatsApp or through a a, a Libra token, is is phenomenally shifted the mindset, right? And it's not about who's reading the hype cycle as much as who's adopting the hype hype life cycle, right? And if if you really look at with the whole curve and beyond, things are already happening, right? And so what we try to do is say, okay, from a pragmatic sense. Does it make sense you enterprise A, B, or C to invest in this, or should you do enough to keep abreast? Or third thing, develop a new business model before you're disrupted, right? And we find ourselves in across all of that big spectrum that has continued to broaden itself, given again the pandemic and all the economic pressures coming from it. So I don't know if I answered your question, but I want to give the audience a flavor of how dynamic this hype cycle and beyond has become. No, I, th I think you um, did a great job of not going too hand wavy consulting. Um, <laughs> so I, I, no, I think uh, uh, everyone appreciates that. But, but, you know, more seriously, it's, uh, I think you, you make a really good point. And I, I think I mentioned this, uh, maybe after you uh, uh, hopped off uh, the podcast, you know, when I was building the hype cycle, I would get feedback from customers mm -hmm. where they would say, you guys aren't releasing this fast enough or enough right. and that, right. you know, uh, you need to compress, you know, your timeframes. And I, I think there's a lot to that. I think we need to look at technology um, innovation and adoption uh, on a more, uh, from a perspective of less of, hey, this, we, we do a checkpoint and then we come back a year later, but rather we need to constantly monitor the evolution of these technologies because they are changing uh, faster than we can do the analysis in a lot of cases. That is exactly right. And without going into names, you worked with a large aircraft manufacturing company. They looked at technology like blockchain and say, how can we create and reinvent ourselves they're a hundred-year-old company and plus or more, rather, right? Yep. So if you're if they were gonna leapfrog rather than say, let's digitally transform ourselves, which is the always the uber cool idea, let's leapfrog the digital divide from somebody that has you know the world's largest uh, captive uh, engine manufacturing facility to something that they can monetize immediately if they did the right capital investment, had the right partner, in this case, of course, Microsoft, and had the right business model to put together to say, okay, I'm not going to wait for the technology. I'm just going to grab it, absorb it, because it's adapt, adopt, or die. Right. And so when you have those real uh, sort of um, uh, uh, questions staring at you, if you're a senior executive in a large organization saying, hold on a minute, if I can adapt, adopt, or I'm facing this existential crisis of continuing shrinking shareholder value and squeezing maximum mar margin out of the, every little bit of my current business, how do I not do that? How do I do better? 
And you know the best example? Even in the pandemic, again, I, you know, I mentioned this earlier uh, when we were speaking, Mike, but every brick and mortar retailer has done spectacularly right. during the pandemic. They were ready. They knew they had to compete with the behemoth, no names, right? Mm. That you can buy everything there or you be ready for the channel that's coming and it's, and it's coming, 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 bam. Who knew there was gonna be a pandemic, but people were ready from retailer A to retailer B that's, that, that's competing in that high throughput grocery to clothing to stationary segment, they were ready. And everybody's beating earnings, why? Because even if they lost in-store traffic, online just replaced that whole thing, right? And they were ready. And so they weren't waiting to say they invested early and this is the benefit of doing investing early, whether it's cloud, whether it's AI, it's blockchain, it doesn't matter, they were ready. And they had a vision that they were able to invest and keep moving for something like this. And you can, you know, going back a year, sorry, just to finish, yeah. who but they had the foresight, right? And, and that's what it takes to, to take the hype cycle, decipher it for your organization and say, you know, it's not about one A, B or C. It's a combination of things that I can create for a new business. Now, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here uh, because you are the blockchain leader for the United States. And uh, Gartner has taken blockchain off of the emerging technologies hype cycle this year. Um, you know, uh, before you answer, I'll put myself out on a limb here a little bit and say, you know, I'm kind of scratching my head a little bit about that one. Uh, and you know, yeah, there's, you know, philosophically, I disagree, but also it seems to contradict a lot of the research that is coming from Gartner when, you know, Gartner, you know, themselves say that, uh, blockchain's going to pop here over the next five or so years, you know, that's really when we're going to see the value is in that 2025 to 2030 timeframe is really where we're going to see that I think it was $2.5 trillion of business value uh, coming from from blockchain. So for me, I was really surprised. Um, but for you, you know, was that something you were surprised with concerned? What are you thinking? Um. I would say I'm. I was expecting it, but not, you know, so abrupt uh, that it would just come off the high cycle um, because it's not out the trough of illusionment, so to speak. But I'm glad it's beyond. It's at that bottom level. Why? Because then it becomes more pragmatic, right? And if you look at cloud providers, including Microsoft, for example, blockchain is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. What do you need it to do? That's the big question. And if folks are looking at blockchain as this esoteric concept sitting out there in the universe saying, hey, maybe I should do something interesting with blockchain today, it's not going to work, right? Yeah. It was like six years ago saying, oh, this big data thing, oh, maybe I should do something better with it. Look what has happened. The big data evolution of distributed computing has completely evolved into learning, deep learning, machine, all of the learning com components, right? And so now nobody questions AI. I think... And people now understand to get AI to be effective, you need good data, right? And now it's AI. People are hiring for AI ethicists. Can you imagine, right? Why? Because it's gotten to the level where you don't trust the machine anymore, right? And so, so what? I, what my from from a blockchain and the and the Gartner hype cycle, I think what Gartner is missing, and I think the 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 overall community of enterprise uh, executives are missing is, in my mind, is the ability for this to be a new business model, right? I go back to the experience that you had with your client, we're having with our customers, where custom, where clients are looking at and saying, how do I establish a new business using a trusted ecosystem? That's what blockchain is, yep. right? And we haven't even talked about digital assets, right? If you look at one of the largest payment gateways, I can't name them, I'm sorry, <laughs> right? The largest payment gateways uh, that also seems has a, a sister social media company, which is one of the largest in the world, had the foresight to hear my point earlier to say, maybe, just maybe, the millennial generation and beyond are savvy enough to understand digital tokens, are savvy enough to understand digital currency, and they may want to transact on it one day. That was 
two years ago. Last quarter, this payment gateway company reported $850 million in crypto payments alone. Yeah. Right? Who saw that coming? Well, again, it's foresight, it's planning, getting ready, and, and understanding a lot of misconception is because of the hype and the fact that Gartner took it out. I'm glad because then there's no more focus on it. And the smart business decision makers and the smart sort of planners, if I can say that, of capital investment <laughs> are actually going to go do stuff, right? Yeah. And I, I, I'll leave you with that thought is the, the coming de deregulation, right? And we know this existing administration is a big fan of deregulation. And if you see, uh, this is something for your audience as well, it, because I deal with it every day. I don't know if, if folks in the, in the, in the non-banking world follow this, but there's an organization called the Office of the Comptroller of Currency, OCC. And the OCC just announced about six weeks ago that any nationalized, nationalized chartered bank can offer custody services. You don't have to go to large exchanges. You don't have to go buy your crypto at four or five gateways. Any bank can offer it now. Can you imagine the bank service fees in terms of assets under custody, assets under management, the opportunity it provides? It's enormous. And so our whole pipeline just went boom, right, in terms of customer demand. But that's what folks are missing. And that's what's missing in the hype cycle is understanding this massive change on the digital payment and ecosystem side and then everything else where the business models are fundamentally changing. Yeah, and you know, uh, typically, uh, what happens with the the hype cycle is uh, a set of trends are 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 generated as a result that kind of, for for lack of better terms, categorizes some of these technologies that are on the hype cycle. And sure. um, you know, if I if memory serves me correctly, and it may or may not, given. Uh, uh, my uh, my tasty Woodford Reserve here, uh, and uh, uh, they're not sponsoring the show, but I would perfectly be happy for them to. Um, it did. <laughs> there's, uh, I think, uh, five key trends that they identified. They said that there's a notion of uh, digital me, um, mm -hmm. uh, composite business. Um, what was the other ones? Uh, See, I had them all in my head there, and then I got put on the spot, and now I'm forgetting them. Uh, digital me, composited business. Um, jump in. I think it was applied trust or something. That is oh, blocked. Oh, yes. The other day. That and is then, blocked. The other day. And then there was the AI one. Correct. Right. And so the applied trust is what blockchain inherently is. It's trusted data, trusted commerce, trusted identity. Right. So from a, again, and not to you know, do a sort of a uh, plug for KPMG. But when we looked at blockchain, we said, forget the technology. If it's truly in its spirit and in its physical implementation, an immutable record, it's reshaping the concept of business trust, yeah. right? So we said, Let, let's just call it digital trust. And so, because you're digitizing trust, you're taking a whole concept and you've digitized it on a massive cloud infrastructure. Again, you know, shout out to Azure, you guys are great partners. And, and, and because of that integrated view of how these things have come together, I think the Gartner's view on applied trust is very true. Um, but the way it's going to manifest itself is again, going back to business models, right? What do you need digital trust for? Identities, transactions, data, they, and especially now with with COVID vaccines, COVID testing, patient information flying willy nilly all over the place. How do you triangulate, quadrangulate, if that's the word, and say between patient, hospital, test results, and treatment, you have a coordinated, trusted infrastructure to manage this, and it, people are racing to save lives. So this is not the time. But it's absolutely where a lot of our customers are thinking through is like, how do I get ready for wave two? How do I get make sure that my COVID vaccine supply, of which there's at least two dozen now, you know, that are likely candidates. How do I manage inventory? How do I produce enough to inoculate enough of the high risk population? Right. And so those are big questions that we're trying to solve for. And Mike, the question back to me is like, what's what's blockchain going to do with it? Yeah. Right? Applied trust. No, you're absolutely right. And that's why, uh, you know, another reason 
why I was surprised that um, uh, blockchain was removed from the list because, you know, uh, I, I agree that it's nice to kind of get it off the, the radar as far as something being hyped. But, you know, oftentimes, you know, what I see and, and, and how I see customers using the hype cycle is they use it as kind of their uh, radar map of what technologies do they need to pay attention to. And from that perspective, that's more of where the disappointment is. I agree that largely uh, the hype in the original kind of viewpoint of uh, blockchain is, you know, past the curve. But I think for the usage of blockchain in business applications, that's where I don't think it's quite as far along. I think we, we still have a ways to go when we start talking about uh, really re-architecting uh, our businesses in these uh, digital ecosystems, or sometimes they're called consortiums. Uh, but when we're rewiring our B2B relationships in very material ways, using this technology and other technologies with it, uh, I think that is 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 a big miss on why not to include. And, and you could call it distributed ledger. You could call it lots of different things, but. You know, I think that that still very much uh, needs to be represented as a technology that people need to pay attention to. So that's that's the only area where I'm like, I get it, Gartner. But on the other other side of it is I don't get it. It's this, you know, we're, we're saying uh, similar things, but in different ways. Right. So but I agree with that. And. And so the trends, you know, I think they were this year and, and, and the panelists, uh, we talked about this on uh, the other day um, that, you know, we all kind of felt that these were kind of non-obvious or these were somewhat obvious trends. They weren't kind of cutting cutting edge trends, because if you if you read the hype cycle, the hype cycle is supposed to represent what's going to happen over the next five to 10 years, not next year, not two or three years. But this is, you know, Horizon 3. Uh, vantage point. And so, you know, I've got a set of, of, of technologies and trends that I thought should have been represented uh, on, on the hype cycle. Um, were there some things that you felt that needed to be included on the hype cycle that perhaps uh, were not? Oh, where do I start? <laughs> so I think the two things that come to mind, right? Because my brain can only process two bullets or threes, right? That's my co the consultant head. But uh, in, in two things. One was identity. I did not see the reshaping of identity software, key management, and the democratization of identity that's already here. Right. Right. Gardner or, or any other large uh, think tank uh, or you know leading agency, whomever you want to call out, has to talk about how we're transitioning from hardware managed identities to software managed identities. And there has been a massive amount of investment, capital infrastructure to innovation from large universities academic relationships that even Microsoft is investing in, you know that in Seattle, that identities have become, again, ubiquitous, but also super fine grain. Why? California Consumer Protection Act, GDPR, these large regulatory changes aren't going away. Yes, organizations are saying, oh, well, we're GDPR compliant, right? Some of your listener, listeners and the people listening to this may say, hey, well, we went through GDPR compliance. Great. You're retroactively GDPR compliant. Right. What do you do with the future state? Are you going to stay that way? No. And as, as, as identities get connected to our connected devices, there is a significant process and sh shaping of those tech biometrics like face id fingerprint you know now you know with the qualcomm snapdragon processor it's the blood blood flow in my thumb it's no longer uh, it, it was missing that the whole concept is not anywhere to be found yet every chief information security officer every chief financial officer has to deal with data data theft or identity theft or a bit of both and it's a huge capital investment whether you look at a headline tomorrow or day after, it's coming and it's always there. Why? 
because anything you can encrypt, you can always decrypt. So something around identity was missing and I felt that should have been elevated, to, especially in a day like when we're in a time like today where we're so connected and everything is on network, online all the time, you have compromise, you just do. So I think that was that one part of identity. And the, and the next thing I think that I, I, I hoped to have seen more was around payments and, and the whole point about, it ties to identity, but the evolution and payment lifecycle and gateways and processors and third parties, and like, you know, I, I can name this publicly, why was Wirecard so successful? And why was why did it tank so spectacularly? Because the model was great, executed badly for other reasons, but that reshaped the world and right. of payments. And now you have all these legacy payment infrastructure companies that are now, again, remember my leapfrog comment, they're all leapfrogging to, to not only catch up, they're already there. And so whether it's B2B payments or B2B to C, and this is the the the, the real, where the rubber meets the road, where the hype cycle is behind the hype, if I can say that. You know one of the largest social media companies in, in, in California is launching its own payment gateway on its social media platform. Why? They're going after this decentralized banking infrastructure, which was never on the hype cycle. So I feel that identity and payments are so integral to any future infrastructural change or capital investment they not only really deserve conversation, that's why I'm bringing it up, and thank you for the forum, Mike. They deserve a lot more um, sort of in research and understanding, and and there's, there's, not, there's a huge lack of standards. There's a huge lack of denomination in terms of what to do where. That's why regulators are so up in arms, which is great for people like us, because we come in and say, hold on a minute, you can just put a payment gateway over this. This is what you should do, which is great. But those two things are so integral to Com again, contactless commerce, right, and seam seamless hyperconnectivity. We've got to, we've got to, we, sh we should have had that on the list. And if not, by by you and I talking about this, hopefully it'll get 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 there. Yeah, you know, I I, I tend to agree, and I think it's you know uh, maybe it's because I, uh, I I tend to want to make things uh, maybe perhaps broader than uh, they need to be. But you know, I think. You know, payments is very specific. I think, you know, some of the words that you were using around just generally next generation commerce, you know, yes. how, how is that going to occur? And, you know, what is what what are payments? Right. Correct. Because, you know, a payment may be a service. Maybe um, uh, there's something right. exchanged uh, uh, as a result. And so uh, I think, you know, some of these traditional payment notions are really starting to break down. But also, you know, uh, we're not just talking about consumers, we're talking about businesses also exchanging uh, uh, some sort of monetary value between them. And what will that look like once the consumer leads the way with this new form of payments as well? That's right. And, and uh, again, your, your, your listeners can Google this. There's a large analytics software company that just bought $250 million of Bitcoin. Why? It's a reserve currency in their mind. Yep. So what does that send a statement in the B2B world now, right? And so the, the organizations are already, remember the leapfrog, this is a huge leapfrog moment for corporations and boards to say, holy cannoli, we can actually invest. And it's it's an endowment, right? And you make the endowment work. And so that's that's the whole point of next generation systems, but also next generation commerce that is, flowing from organizations to consumers and back again. Yeah. You know, uh, another set of technologies, and this is more of a grouping of technologies because uh, there's a lot that goes with this, and, and I'd, I'd love your thoughts on uh, what you think about it. Um, but, you know, what I find underrepresented on the hype cycle, and this has been traditionally has been underrepresented, but I think... Uh, now more than ever, uh, ever, it needs to be represented, which is um, sustainability tech. <laughs> you know, um, you know, I want to see some of these renewable technologies uh, on the hype cycle. You know, I saw, you know, uh, carbon based transistors on there. Yeah, that's great. But, you know, what's the next generation battery tech that's that's going to yeah. fuel us into the future? 
Um, no. you know, I want to understand, uh, some of the, you know, let's, let's, let's get out there. Let's get wild with this. Cause this is 10 years out, you know, things like, um, urban vertical farming, you know, mm -hmm. what's up with that? Um, you know, uh, you know, things that we see coming from, uh, intellectual ventures and the Bill and Melinda Gates foundation around, um, uh, helping third world countries with renewable water tech where you can take a to toilet water and recycle it as drinkable water. I mean, mm -hmm. the, these technologies with all the things that, that are happening with global warming, uh, with the global pandemic, I mean, this makes sense to talk about, especially now. Uh, there are, mm -hmm. are entire economies that are being built around these technologies. And I named, you know, uh, five out of 20 or 30 technologies out there. You know, uh, as far as you're concerned, Arun, you know, what do you think about that? Is that too far out there? Is that crazy talk? Or do you do you agree with that? No, absolutely not. And uh, the big catalyst that is driving a lot of capital infra infrastructure spend is the EU stimulus bill. So we've been following it very closely. And I mentioned it again. Maybe your listeners can Google it. Um, I, I've become a Google source here. <laughs> Um, the EU ETS or the EU emissions standard is tied to the EU 3 trillion euro stimulus program across all European nations. And they, they essentially have had the foresight again to say, not only are you going to invest in clean tech, you're going to actually make and create jobs. You're going to rebuild the economy. And the way I see it from a, from a green tech, clean tech 14 years ago, there was a lot of hype. Oh, wind farms, you're going to set, you know, I live in Massachusetts right across the bay. You're going to set up. And nobody wanted that. Right? It was just too early. Now, looking at the pandemic, not only are people waking up, they're saying, never again, but how do we get ahead of this climate crisis? I mean, in this morning, you had a Category 5 storm or you had that one-two punch storm hitting Louisiana. It's never happened. Uh, it happened 100 years ago, but it's coming back. The water temperature is giving... Right, so people now understand, okay, this is different. But coming back to tech again, I think there's three groups that we see emerging. It's the monitor, manage, and disrupt. If those are three categories of sustainability tech, I'll put it that way. And <clears throat> we've been working closely, you know, that Microsoft and us in climate accounting, because climate accounting is something that most institutions are, the, is the first step, it's like step zero, and saying, okay, how do I even establish what my carbon footprint is. Once I know that, then I can deploy sustainable technologies or technologies that enable my sustainable sustainability goals, right? It's it's a little bit of that, but big enterprises have to take that leap, number one. Second, when it comes to startups, nobody is sitting quietly at this point. Whether it's academic institutions, the next solar panel, next battery tech, to your point, distribution of power, Mike, is gonna be the next disruptor because you're going to have microgrids. You have enough solar panels across cities today where even in Columbus, Ohio, right, there's a large financial institution producing more power, and you know you know who I'm talking about, and than they're consuming. So if you're already a green in tech building that is generating more than consuming, you're at you're you're driving better outcome, right? So Again, I go back to manage, monitor, and 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 disrupt. So I think there's, there's those three categories. But I think, to your point, it's not on the hype cycle, but people aren't waiting, and that's why I feel that the hype cycle needs to sort of look at some of these larger indications. But beyond the larger indications, capital infrastructure is just moving. The train's moving. People are doing things. They sometimes talk about it, they don't, especially the, the Gen Z, the millennial population that's looking at this. Concepts like micro lending of you know, ESG credits, things like tokenizing power trading, right? There's large platform, four power platform platforms that are, if my house is generating more electricity than I'm consuming, I can trade that on a network. That's tech, that's awesome tech. That's these that's completely disrupting the the known model of, oh, I have to subscribe to a utility or cor corporation to manage my power ecosystem. I can put in a power wall and I'm self-sufficient, Yep. right? That's, that's progress and that's the tech that we're not talking about. And I completely violently agree that it needs to be and it, and it has to be 
and and more so, and I'll finish at the start, is in the, again, in the pandemic, every electric vehicle IPO has gone gangbusters. Yep. Not only, you can say, you can argue, everybody, oh, one more EV, yeah. Why? There's just not enough of them. And that's why I think that the differentiated tech and just a conserving, conservation of, conservation of energy, distribution of energy, and then generation of energy, if I can put it in those three terms, is going to be fundamental in the next decade, or even three years. No, I agree. And uh, we see uh, not only as a, perhaps a marketing um, uh, push, but also uh, companies are materially investing. It's not just, you know, the, the Googles and the Microsofts of the world, but, you know, you've got, you know, Amazon that's making some serious commitments in this space where, you know, it's easy for, it's easier for maybe a company like Microsoft that builds software, uh, and doesn't have a highly complicated supply chain and, you know, sure. uh, you know, dealing with global logistics. I mean, there's a lot of uh, fuel that's being burnt uh, in, in that world. And to see someone like Amazon double down on uh, the sustainability commitment uh, just kind of blows you away. And, um, you know, whether it's tax incentives or not, um, I think people are really waking up and saying, you know, we've got to do something about this. Uh, and, you know, this is going to go into a, a, a related set of technologies to what we're talking about, which is uh, autonomy. And so another set of technologies that uh, I thought uh, was interesting that was removed from the hype cycle, and I get they've been on the hype cycle for for a little while, but uh, as a result of the pandemic and us wanting to move to more of a touchless and distanced society uh, to a degree, uh, you know, as, as you said, with the EV side of the house, the autonomous vehicle side of the house is getting a ton of attention. It's getting a ton of funding. Um, you know, uh, even uh, uh, there's a, about a handful of autonomous flying vehicle companies. Uh, but of those, we're seeing plans accelerate with the, um, the L.A. Uh, and uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, flying autonomous taxis. We know that it's already being done in Dubai. London's looking at this seriously. And so to drop kind of level four, level five uh, autonomous uh, vehicles from the list, I thought that was another big miss because uh, maybe last year I could see, okay, well, maybe I could justify that. But given the societal drivers, I don't know. It's kind of it's it's hard for me to see removing those, uh, given where we're going. What do you think? So now I, I completely agree. the The unfortunate part of the Gartner hype cycle is so enterprise focused that it. it so if you if you look at large semiconductor companies, whether it's the Bay Area or down in San Diego. They are reshaping everything, right? Yeah. You remember identity and, you know, again, next-gen commerce or trustless commerce, whatever, trusted commerce, whatever you want to call it. All of that is, is new tech, and it's, it's new tech predicated on, to your point of us, autonomous. They didn't even talk about 5G, mm-hmm. right? And so 5G is here. I have a 5G Samsung phone. On a 5G network by T-Mobile, okay, it's not the most, you know, powerful localized band, but it's still 5G at, you know, I get 100 bips at any given day at any given place because I'm in an urban area, but you get my point. 5G and autonomous and semi-autonomous computing are, again, super integrated, and not having that was a big miss, but also I think the... The commercial aspect of that for organizations that are doing things like, you know, NFC chips and on, on, on today sensor technology on the front of a truck, right? That is 100% EV vehicle is a whole different set of tech that ever ever existed. And to to my point earlier and what you were saying, enterprises have to look and say, okay, how do I ride that bus? No pun intended, but fully implied, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> right and and so enterprises have to say okay if there's an option governments even right if if you have a fully integrated autonomous 
data capture, toll gate booths, right? You live in Ohio. ODOT is one of the most ex most advanced transportation agencies. Believe it or not, they are. I've worked with a few agencies, and if if, if some of those agencies can look at this tech and look at Gartner and say, hey, Gartner, or hey, whoever, what do you think about autonomous computing edge and the inclusion using 5G networks? You've changed things. You've changed governance. You've changed data and availability big time. Large part of rural America still struggles with connectivity today. To your point about equity, right? 5G is that next gen equity. And we have to talk about it. Otherwise, and with all that's going on in the country right now, equity and tech have to die. And that has to be the central theme in anything we do. You or I as professionals, I'm, I'm sorry to become a little philosophical, but it's true. That's Every day we wake up as a team at, at the firm and we say, how, how are we enabling equity? And that's it's a big question. We never, six months ago, we never asked, us, asked ourselves that. Neither were our customers. But today, if you leave that conversation, you change the conversation. Well, and let's face it as well. Um... You know, you've got 5G on your phone. Um, that's hardly an emerging technology. So why aren't we talking about the 6G standard that <laughs> is being developed and ratified right now? Um, you know, that's the emerging tech, right? Why aren't we talking yeah. about the uh, Wi-Fi protocols uh, that are the next-gen Wi-Fi protocols that... You know, it's not just going to be cellular technology. It's going to be a combination of Wi-Fi and cellular technologies uh, oh, working in conjunction together uh, based on the scenario in which you're trying to uh, to build out. So, yeah, the, there's private 5G that's on the hype cycle right now, but that's already here. Uh, that's a foregone conclusion. Of course, that's the safe answer. Really, it's, you know, what is next? I mean, that's really what I look at the hype cycle for is to see what's coming and what should I care about? Because remember, you know, the promise of the hype cycle is to take the 2000 technologies that uh, Gartner reviews and they say that what gets put on the Gartner emerging tech hype cycle is the 30 to 40 most impactful technologies to business. And so, you know, that's where I look at some of these and I'm just like, okay, I get it. Uh, however, you know, there are going to be much, much more impactful technologies in that four, five, six year horizon that need to be represented. And, um, you know, when, when I wrote the hype cycle my last year, uh, I created a trend called uh, do-it-yourself biohacking. And really the assertion there was my belief, and it's actually still my belief, that it's not really about biohacking. Um, really the differentiator for that trend is the DIY part. And that, you know, I can edit my genes at home. Um, there are people doing that right now, as scary as that sounds. Um, and, you know, human augmentation uh, and, and, and biohacking can be as uh, least intrusive as having uh, wearable technology that is hovering on top of my skin and monitoring my body uh, to uh, contact lenses that can project augmented reality or record video or check for glaucoma or diabetes or what have you to things that are much more intrusive, like tattoos that have circuitry built in to, you know, actual devices, nanobot technology, et cetera. I'll, you know, that's kind of what I think about that's coming across the horizon. Um, not necessarily some, you know, like a digital passport or whatever, you know, that stuff is here today. I'm looking for as an enterprise, what, what's going to impact me? And it may not be a product or service I ever make, but for things like autonomous vehicles, um, how do my people get to work? Mm -hmm. uh, if, you know, most companies have a parking lot. What happens to this space? Uh, do I still have to pay for this space? Uh, can I recoup that space? What can I do with it? Um, you know, it changes the dynamic. And especially when I've got a workforce that, you know, uh, let's say gets augmented and you've got an employee for religious reasons, maybe uh, they're frugal or they just don't believe in it. 
you get one employee that's augmented and can significantly outperform the other person that just believes not in augmenting themselves. So who gets the bonus in their performance review? <laughs> Is it fair ethically to give it to the person that chose on their own dime to get augmented versus the one that didn't? I mean, these are some serious questions that we're going to have to ask ourselves. And so, you know, that's at least personally what I look to the hype cycle for is to give me some inspiration on, you know, what I'm not thinking about yet. Uh, that's just me. I don't know about you. I find the hype cycle also um, just being not, not just not trying to be pro provocative here, but um, it, people look and folks look at the hype cycle and say, it, it, Oh, it's on the hype cycle. Then it must be nonsense. Right. Uh, because it's not real, it's overhyped, it's a hype, it, it, it doesn't exist, it, it cannot do this, it cannot do that. So there's a lot of preconceived notions, right? And then, so what gets off the hype cycle always excites me, right? Because then it's, it's either real or it, it failed, right? And in either which way, it people, you know, you are getting a little more pragmatic about what it is and versus what is not, yeah. right? So I, again, the other thing that you, you're talking four or five years from now or 10 years from now, Qubits are going to reshape any form of security. Okay, we're not talking about qubits, but qubits are here. And, I, and in the last segment, I did mention it's a national security issue, and it should be. Yep. But qubits are going to fundamentally reshape any enterprise, whether it's it's what they do in retail, whether they're a heavy engineering manufacturer or distribution company, it doesn't matter. Qubits are the way that it approaches any kind of, again, data identity or transaction, core fundamentals of any business operation, it's just going to blow it away, right? So by putting it on the hype cycle, and even if it's not on the hype cycle, maybe it deserves a, con 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 a conversation. At some point, I'll get my words right. But, you know, the, the, the concept versus, you know, as soon as it gets on the hype cycle, people stay away from it. Right, they step back and say, oh, it's on the hype cycle, so it's really, I don't know, let's figure it out. But the moment it becomes more ubiquitous, especially with a cloud platform like Azure, it, it's it's near, it's real. Five years ago, you could set up a Hadoop you know, node on, on Azure and say, hey, this is what I want in 30 seconds or less. Today, you can set up a permission blockchain node 30 seconds or less. What do you want to do with it? How do you want to connect it? Do you look out there, qubits? has impacts on health. You mentioned biohacking, huge impact, right? If you look at CRISPR and what CRISPR is doing, no, everybody said CRISPR you know, can't be done, cannot be done, but everybody in healthcare is alarmed looking at what gene splicing is doing for for, for the world. Well, well, did you see the latest news about the, the Chinese uh, editing the genes of a human baby? Yes, unfortunately, but that's where we are. So, uh... So, yeah, so it, it, it's interesting. And, and as you were talking, um, uh, it, it's unfortunate that the camera can't pick up the light bulbs that kind of pop pop up uh, over over people's heads. But um, you had, you had said something uh, really interesting, and I think it's important for us to kind of elaborate on a little bit more. Uh, you had said uh, you take a technology seriously when it moves off the hype cycle. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I think this is this is important to point out because people generally view the hype cycle in different ways. And so uh, on our panel, when we had our conversation, we had, you know, Mike Fulton from Nationwide Insurance. And, mm -hmm. you know, Mike said, he's like, hey, I use this as a way to educate my innovators on, you know, what we need to pay attention to. Um, and so some organizations look at that as kind of the must know technologies. Uh, we've got to ideate around these, et cetera. But you said something slightly different. And, um, you know, I want to double click on that a bit because I think this is important uh, for a lot of different reasons. But I think the primary reason is, um, and I faced this too when I, when I was at Gartner, um, there is a lot of kind of uh, mysticism or ambiguity around the hype cycle. Um, you know, 
Gartner has actually published a book around. It's called Mastering the Hype Cycle. I uh, actually worked quite a bit with uh, with with the, with uh, 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 Mark and Jackie Finn, who um, wrote that book and had had uh, invented the Gartner Hype Cycle. But it's really a model that's similar to other models. So it's kind of this Frankenstein model. But um, they explain it really well in the book on what it's used for and what to expect from it. But I think the challenge with a lot of folks is they really don't understand uh, the core intention behind the hype cycle. And it can be fairly misleading when you look at it and you see the marketing around it, where people kind of go, well, is it really the, the must do things that I need to focus on? Is it really only um, what's getting the most attention in the market and how to view that attention? Uh, is it a, um, a risk management tool where I look at that and I say, well, uh, if it's on that list, then I need to shy away from it and I need to focus on other things. And so there's a lot of confusion ar around that that I think uh, needs to be de demystified. And I should probably since I know a little bit about the hype cycle, I should probably do a dedicated uh, episode just on that. But I guess for you, Arun, uh, maybe if you could elaborate a little bit on what you meant around um, just some of your feedback on how you interpret the hype cycle. So the hype cycle um, for us, especially when we play system integrated roles, advisory roles, strategy roles, to organizations, it's it's a good benchmark, right? It's a good pressure test mechanism to say, did we consider this? And did we not consider this? What is, you know, to us, the hype cycle is sort of the consultant's um, sort of uh, benchmark tool to say, you know, from a future state perspective, because we always get in and say current state, future state, current state, future state, right? And when we're doing future state, future state cannot be shelfware. Otherwise, we'd be out of work, right? right? So when you have a little bit of the pull in of the hype cycle, a little bit to say, okay, this is something you should think about. But more often than not, because of the way that the hype cycle has been overhyped, I come back to how I open this conversation. A lot of our customers say, okay, Arun, that's all. All that is great and fancy. Let's just focus on focus on the basics this year and next year, and then we'll see where we end up, right? And so it always comes back to that. And the mom and 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 once the hype cycle goes away or something drops off the hype cycle, you draw some of those, even if you dust it off. So for this year, you come back to blockchain, the business I'm in, it's not on the hype cycle. But if you draw it into a future state conversation and say, if you thought about a trusted commercial gateway for your inventory or your manufacturing process, people adapt to it because again, go back to my adapt, adopt, or die. And you've no longer talked about a hype cycle. You've actually talked about something that's going to help them evolve their business model using, you know, whether you're using blockchain or you're calling it trusted transaction, it doesn't matter, right? Yeah. And so that's what I find. That's where, where I take inspiration from. I'm not saying that hype cycle is not useful. Of course, it's useful. But I also find it comes with that overhang of saying because it's hype cycle, it, it, it's not real. Yeah, you know, I think uh, uh, I think you're right, and you know, I think it's easy for uh, seasoned technology professionals to pick anything apart, right? <laughs> um, right. In, in, in some ways, you know, that's uh, what we're really good at, um, and you know, I, like we talked about, you know, with with the other panelists when you weren't on there, you know, um, you know, we actually brought this up that hey, we've been kind of picking on this a little bit. Um, and you know, the good news is, is, you know, uh, I can tell you as a former analyst, everything's peer reviewed by everybody within the company and everything that we're saying is like child's play, uh, you know, on the exchanges that occur, uh, to, uh, vet and validate this stuff. So I'm sure that there were very passionate conversations around some of the things that we've been talking about. Uh, I am most certain that 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 has happened. Uh, but um, but it's also important, I think, for for them to hear because I, I know that, uh, uh, that there are a few that do listen to this podcast. So, <laughs> um, 
but uh, but but yeah, you know, uh, I, I think it's it, you know it's out in the world, and we should um, pressure test these things. And no one's going to get this right. The future is always in motion. No one really knows what's going to happen. Um, and I would almost love to see Gartner put uh, probability numbers back on um, their predictions. I would actually like to see that um, to give people an idea. And actually, it would give Gartner some wiggle room to kind of push the envelope a bit, a little bit and say, look, this is what we think right now. You got a 50-50 shot that this is going to be probable or not. But, you know, hey, we're going to throw this out into the universe and see what happens. Uh, I think that's fine as well. Absolutely. And and I go back to, you know, sort of in, 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 in parting thoughts, I think the... We also get called into saying, okay, we're looking to invest in this little startup, right? And it's it's this technology we don't understand. We looked at Gartner's report. It looks attractive. Can you help? So we become sort of the translator of choice and saying, taking the hype cycle and saying, should you invest in something? Remember my leapfrog comment. And so we're also, from a hype cycle sort of um, uh, on how it helps organizations, I think a lot of organizations that are, you know, some of my clients are PE organizations. Some of them are venture arms of a large corporation. And they're saying, instead of us building this uh, in a nascent, captive way, why don't we just do an inorganic acquisition? And in, in, in doing so, can someone like us come in and help sort of assess, but also make that, because it's on the garden hype cycle, it's somewhat there but it may not be so let's test it out right and so mm -hmm. it, it, it's it's helpful in those ways in terms of being that again that benchmark but again when you look towards it in towards an adoption there is that struggle to say is it worth the capital investment versus saying let's just see if we can go acquire somebody and make the commercial mo model work uh, based on what we saw in the hype cycle if that makes sense no it does um and so I guess, um, you know, as, as we wrap up, Arun, um, I, I'm going to ask you uh, a question. The answer cannot be blockchain. <laughs> but uh, if there was, let's just say, uh, three technologies that are either on the hype cycle or they're not on the hype cycle, what do you think are... Uh, in your mind, the three most important uh, technologies over the next five to 10 years? So I, the way I see it, it comes back to, we talked about sustainability tech, but when I look at sustainability tech, it's equity, right? And to get equity of any kind of tech, you need connections, right? And to me, the horizon and the investments of, ubiquitous connectivity is still, we don't have last mile. We don't have, we talk about these things and I, and I, and I, and I know we want to be future-based, Mike, but I come back to the practicality yep. of connected anywhere. It does, it still not, does not exist. 6G, 7G doesn't matter. Connected anywhere doesn't exist. So why don't we, and why don't we figure out as technologists and professionals what we as a community have to come together to talk about connected anywhere that always comes to mind right because once you have connectivity you can do anything right and so i think that's one thing to solve for and and either gets on the hype list or at least i think about it all the time the second thing that in terms of um this i deal with it every day but again looking four or five years out in the future is the consumer to consumer peer based commerce to me the b2b to b2c is going to go in, and diminish itself mike and arun transacting you are we're we're doing it today in, in things like venmo and other components but 4 or 5 years from now that is the only way to transact why because the payment systems and the ecosystems the the connected tissue organ of commerce is going to be consumer to consumer, peer to peer, right? right? The systems are there. The decentralized infrastructure is there. Regulate, regulators are waking up now. But if I look three to five years, peer to peer commerce is the only way to transact. That's, that's how it's going to be. And the third thing, you gave me only three things. I could go on for 10, but anyway, <laughs> 
The third thing I would say is essentially expedited health. Right? When I what I mean by expedited health, it's even today if you look at just the pandemic, right? Let's take the pandemic's telemedicine leap till today, till March or April. Everybody said telehealth, ah, it just it exists somewhere, in some pockets. Now all of a sudden nobody wants to go into a doctor's office because it's as good. It was there. Now, if you fast forward four or five years from now, the ability to do in-home care, whether it is devices, whether it is surgery, whether to your point about biohacking and other things, the ability to manage connected care is going to be very, very different than we know. And I bring up healthcare because that is going to help us stay ahead of the next pandemic. And I mean that in all seriousness. Yeah. So if I, if I think of those three things in big, broad terms, three to five years, that's what I'm thinking about. That's what I'm planning for. Blockchain is just one stepping way to create a new trusted ecosystem. Blockchain, you know, I, this is a, a, a space and time. If I can say that, right? We can stand it up, build it, and we are on to the next thing. So to me, those three things are very, very important especially as the globe and, and the global ecosystem are much more of a connected tissue than we actually admit it to be. You know, um, I, uh, I, I agree with you and I, um, I definitely agree with, uh, those key themes. I think those, um, w what you're communicating seems to me, uh, more, and, you know, kind of trends, uh, rather than any one specific technology. Uh, or solutions. And I think it's really important for us to know that any w individual technology that may be re represented on the hype cycle uh, can't solve your problems. You know, it's really the convergence of many of these technologies right. in meaningful ways. And a lot of what we've talked about so, so far um, here on, on, on the podcast has been around bringing these technologies together in meaningful ways. So when we talk about sustainability tech, you know, there's uh, a sprinkle of, of blockchain in there. There's a sprinkle of artificial intelligence in there. There's robotics, mm -hmm. there's IOT. There's lots of technologies that come together to make that a reality. And so um, I think that where we have to shift towards as an industry is we need to start incorporating more, at least in my opinion, uh, more of the non-technical forces that are at play mm -hmm. that are forcing our hands with technology. Because what's happening with technology is it's becoming more and more transparent. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's blending into the background where it's not obvious that we're using it. So, you know, um, you know, I used to do, uh, you know, uh, uh, keynote presentations at, at Gartner where I'd get up on stage and I would ask the audience a question. I would say, uh, how many of you have used artificial intelligence today? And uh, maybe a quarter of the people would raise their hands. And then I would ask another question as I'd say, how many of you have checked the weather today? And, you know, 75% of the hands go up. How many of you checked your Facebook feed today? And, you know, almost everyone's hands go, go up. And I said, well, guess what? You used AI today. Um, <laughs> and so a lot of these technologies uh, are today blurred into the background. I mean, you held up your phone. I mean, there's so much tech that's built into that that is represented on that hype cycle that we don't even realize. Um, and so I think, you know... I would like to see instead of five trends, I would love to see them, you know, say, here are the 10 emerging technology trends that you really need to understand. And oh, by the way, there are these technologies that support those. But really, the more important thing here is the trend itself and tying that back to very real practical things that are happening. Um, and, you know, to your point, it's what are the tipping points that we're evaluating? Mm -hmm. That's leading us to these assertions. So if we say that we're going to live in a touchless world, um, you know, or or as touchless as possible, that's forcing folks like McDonald's to uh, continuously move forward their autonomous projects around, you know, restaurants and actually making a Big Mac. I mean, uh, 
when I was at Gartner, I wrote a research note. I mean, this was a room. This was like five, six years ago, uh, where, you know, I talked to the, the McDonald's folks and they already had, uh, as far as their bun toasting process, uh, they used artificial intelligence and robotics to toast all their buns, which saved them a ton of money, a ton of time uh, by doing that. And then they evolved it to actually making the burgers themselves and, and all that. So the tech is there. But I think now uh, some of these non-technical trends have been the catalyst to really push this stuff forward. So if there was any critique you know, I think, you know, it's, it's along the lines of what, what, you, what you were saying is become more relevant with the social, the behavioral, the economic trends that are happening around us mm -hmm. and make sure that that's reflected in your predictions and your hype cycles. Um, and, you know, I think that's, that's the big message, at least uh, uh, from, from me. And I think I'm uh, uh, extracting that or, or interpreting that from you as well. That's exactly it. And so, um, I think overall, again, it's a good, it's always good to ground, but how do you make practical use? So Rune, um, you know, people listening, you know, uh, they're like, Hey, I, you know, I kind of like this guy. He drinks good bourbon. Uh, he's got some, some, some good ideas. Or maybe a Gartner analyst wants to come and chase you down and give you uh, a, a few uh, few words. Uh, how, how can how can people get a hold of you? LinkedIn is the best way. Rune Ghosh. You can find me on LinkedIn. Message me. Um, that is, I'm usually on there all the time. I'm also on Twitter, but I usually hide because I find too many trolls sometimes. But uh, LinkedIn is the best way. Very good. Well, well, listen, you know, uh, as always, uh, you know, I, you know, I learn a ton from, from these conversations and hopefully everyone else has as well. Um, it was great having you on again and, uh, look forward to the next time we have you on. Thank you so much. Good night.